there. I'm Jan Busco, one of the Museum of Northern Arizona botanists, and I'm here with um, Laura Davis, who um, is the volunteer coordinator and curator of the Michael Moore Medicinal Garden, and we're happy to be here with you today on this lovely semi-autumnal day to um, talk about seed collecting and take you on a little walk where we'll collect all kinds of seed. Um, so I guess the first thing I want to say about seed collecting is that to me seeds are just a miracle. Um, you know, we used to buy them in the store in a little package and it's all printed and barcoded and sometimes they're treated with fungicide and all that stuff so they're different weird colors. But the seeds in the wild are just here for us to enjoy and so along with feeding birds and animals they also can be used um, by us to grow plants. And um, by using them, we um, tap into nature's bounty, genetic diversity, um, because the seeds are very much adapted to where we are living. Um, and just kind of a miracle of life when you think of a seed is a living embryo of a plant. So it looks inert, it doesn't look like it's alive. And yet when it has the right conditions and you add water and warmth, it will grow and create a whole plant. So, you know, seeds are just little miracles. And my background is really in science first, but, um, but just um, I think that a lot of people I've worked with, particularly one intern, Dion Ben, who's a Navajo gentleman, really taught me to respect the earth and to really believe that there's something sacred in collecting seed that we honor whatever we believe in, if it's science or life. Um, that we honor that, we keep that in our heart as we collect seeds and really understand the miracle of what we're doing here. And I think right now, in the time of COVID, it's really important um, because the earth is giving us what we need. And um, this is something we can get out and do that is really good for us to interact with the earth and the earth to interact with us. Um, what can you do with your seed when you collect it? You can plant it in your yard. You can give it to a project that needs it for restoration. There are all kinds of opportunities for seed sharing based around the agricultural extension, the museum gardens, and other organizations. And so seed is kind of um, free for us all, which is also nice. You don't have to pay money to get great seed. And um, just something that's a resource for us all. So um, getting back to the practical, I think um, the first thing I think about seeding is the time of collecting seed. And of course, there are some species that you would collect much earlier than this, things that have their flowers in the spring or the early summer. But right now is just the beginning of prime seed collecting time in northern Arizona. So when we start getting the hot days and yet the really cold nights, when things begin to dry down, plants really begin to mature their seeds. And so right now, which is um, mid-September, really until um, things get really moist and musty in November, um, it's a really prime seed collecting time for native seeds here. Um, so I guess when you're collecting seed, important things are um, to have things with you that you need. So one thing is that it really helps to know what you're collecting seed of. And so either knowing your plants in advance, looking them up online and having a picture or having a great guidebook can help you really figure out this is what I'm collecting seed from because you don't want to be collecting seed off of any weeds and spreading those around. And you also don't want to be collecting any seeds of rare or endangered plants or plants that are protected. And so I think the ethics of seed collecting are really important. Um, so the U.S. Forest Service actually allows incidental collection for personal use on the forest. Um, and so if you're going to take a small quantity of something, then that is actually fine. You don't need a permit. The Bureau of Land Management also allows collection on their land. Um, usually beyond that, if it's your own land, it's up to you. Um, you want to contact private landowners if you want to collect on their land. Um, and so the first thing is to make sure that it's okay for you to collect where you're collecting. The second thing is if you are going into a region where there can be rare plants, you want to find out what those are and just be very respectful to not collect them because if everybody thinks like I tend to do, I'm special, I can collect what I want, 
and we all do it, we can actually wipe out some populations of small rare plants. And so we need to be mindful of that. One of the great things about collecting seed, particularly if you have a rare plant and you're growing it in your own garden, is that you can begin to increase the supply and share that for people who need seed so that it reduces the desire to go out and poach rare plants. So take that really seriously. The Forest Service has lists for any area and we can always help you here at the museum if you want to collect. You know, give us a call and we can help you narrow down what it's really important that you protect places. Um, so along with knowing what your plant is, I think you want some basic equipment and I hope I got everything here today. Um, one of the things is gloves which you may or may not want. Um, I have a hard time working in gloves, but if you are collecting anything with milky sap or something that might actually be harmful to you or getting in there with thorns on things or prickles or irritating seed, a good pair of gloves that really is tight fitting and gives you still the ability to feel what you're doing can be really important um, to do that but it's balanced by the fact that sometimes gloves will stick to seed and that's a pain. But usually having some gloves along is a good thing. Um, what are you going to cut this, do with the seeds? A lot of times we'll take seeds off by hand and that's fine. It's usually good to have some kind of pruners along though too, so that when you're collecting seeds, you're not ripping the plants out of the ground, which can happen on something like a penstem and you just pull on that stalk and <laughs> there goes the whole penstem and ripped out of the ground. So cutting can be really nice. Um, so having some sharp pruners, even a good pair of scissors with a good sharp edge can be really helpful. Um, collection, things to put seed in. Um, I like to collect in paper, and the good thing about collecting in paper is that you can leave the seeds in it when you get back um, from where you're going. Um, but um, it's usually good to have some plastic. I can't, oh, there it is, baggy. If you're going to collect fleshy seeds, it can be good to put them in a baggie. It'll protect them from getting juice and things on other stuff. Um, but you have to watch out with baggies because things can rot if you leave them in there. And they also just don't breathe as well as paper. Um, but we do have some little baggies. Of course, if you're going out and doing a lot, you want a big baggie. Um, but anyway, um, seed envelopes. Um, I think some of the go-tos, if you're doing a moderate size collection or you just want it, something that is easy to put seed into, paper lunch bags work really well. Um, you can use little wax paper bags too if you like those. I've taken the time on these to actually tape the bottom up because a lot of these bags just aren't really made to hold anything as fine as even medium-sized seed and they tend to come out the bottom. So I taped it all up because I've had a lot of experience that seeds fall out of the bottom and you don't really want to lose your precious seed. Um, other things, I mean, there's all kinds of sides of seeds. These are um, some very nice recycled Museum of Northern Arizona 2018 gala envelopes. Um, but once again, you want to make sure that they don't leak seeds out the bottom. These will lick closed. Um, and usually when you use something like that and you put your seeds in, it still helps to even fold it up and make sure that you're not losing what you collected. Um, so good opportunity for recycling. All your old mailing envelopes you can use. Um, these are nice. Um, coin envelopes, and these are available in different sizes. Um, sometimes use them in the field, sometimes use these later on after we've processed the seed and cleaned it to put small quantities of seed in. These come in all different sizes. Super nice. And then for super, super fine seed, and I think we're going to be around some today with some coral bells, things like monkey flower that have little fine dust-like seed. These little um, stamp collectors envelopes are super good because they really um, tend to not leak. Even those paper envelopes, you have to tape up and be careful that you're not losing your seed. So these you can get, you know, the typical sources online, um, sometimes hobby stores, but all of these are great too. So let's see. So Laura, do you want to say anything? I My question, only, Jan, was. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mary Poppins time here at the museum. Um, do you label 
when and where and what you collect, you label your, um, your bags. Yes, Laura, I think that's a good idea. So even when you're me and you think you know everything and you go out and you put your seeds in your bag, if you bring them right home, usually you're maybe okay. But certainly I've come to some a couple of weeks later and gone, what are these seeds? No recollection. So as Laura says, it's always good to label your seed bags. Um, and so um, the thing that I like for labeling is Sharpies, I'm not getting paid for this. They haven't contributed to the um, thing, but Sharpies are great because they don't rub off of most things, um, especially the black permanent marker ones. If you get fine tips or colored, they're not really reliable. You can also throw little pieces of paper in your bags too, but you tend to want to put what you have, where you got it from, and the date. Does that sound? Does it? Thank you. Yes, I just, I just wanted to make sure, you, I just wanted to check to see if you did that. Thank okay. you. So, um, we talked about um, what is a seed, reasons to collect seed, I mean, I think there's many, but one is locally, um, local ecotype of seeds, so seed that's going to do super, super well where you are. Another one is you can grow a thousand plants for a very small seed collection, and if you had to buy those thousand plants at the nursery, it might cost you $10,000, so there's some really good economy there. Um, I guess we did caring for collected seed. We'll talk more about caring for collected seed, but if you're out in the field and collecting, um, you really want to make sure, first, on a day like today, that your seed doesn't blow away. But second, you want to try to keep it in a cool, dark place. And so if you're out with a car or a vehicle or a backpack, you just want to make sure you're not leaving it in the baking sun because hot enough temperatures can kill the seed. Um, so I think we're just going to start collecting some seed now. Um, we're going to start here outside on the Easton Collection Center because we've got some really nice native plants in the beds here. And we're just going to talk casually. I think I'm going to put my mask on so Laura can join me in the shots and we don't have to do comedy with the microphone and hope that that works. Um, and so we're going to look at different plants that are in seed or that may be in ready to collect soon, talk about what we're seeing, how we know they're ready to collect, and how we collect this specific seed. For the most part today, we're going to put things in a shared bag, I think, and then we're going to have something that's kind of like a wildflower mix. And that's something you can do at home if you want to have just have a wild meadow or something and get your own wildflower mix going. You don't have to separate out all of your seed. You can just put it in a container. Um, if you want to grow things out in a nursery situation or just go to a seed exchange and know what seeds you're sharing, you probably want to do that separately. But we'll kind of decide on that as we go along. So I'm going to put the list away and all the supplies away and hope that they don't blow anywhere. And we'll get one, maybe we'll get one little bag going. And then if we need the others, Laura's going to get them out. I'm not taking the rocks. <laughs> okay, and then one more is when you're out there hiking or walking around, if you're me, you're even going to um, an event somewhere, if we have any events anymore. But anyway, sometimes you don't have any of your stuff with you. And so it's usually good, you know, it's one of the moments when I appreciate litter is sometimes you can find a piece of paper blowing around that you can fold into a seed envelope. Um, this was one I was out in the pinion juniper and lo and behold I had a um, napkin from fast food which we many of us have in our cars these days available to just roll the seeds up of something that otherwise I would miss if you stuff them into your pockets you just if you're me you forget them you put them in the washer and dryer and there go the seeds so having some creative solutions along with you usually you could take a piece of paper a napkin somebody's old um, you know granola bar wrapper one of those and use it for your incidental seed collecting supplies okay mask is coming up got anything to say Laura while I am masking not on the spot um, okay. <laughs> no 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 I, well, it's funny doing this and I told um, John and Christian about this earlier um, this is very much I, I had a teacher in elementary school who would take us on hikes and she always said take only a picture, leave only a footprint. So the idea of collecting seeds 
is is foreign to me. Only when we get to the Michael Moore Garden, I'll talk a little bit about it more there. Um, so it, it's such, as Jan said, it's such a gift to be able to collect the seeds. And I think it's also just being aware of how many seeds that you see on the plants because this year, and Jan, I'm sure we'll talk about it, not every, not all the plants are producing seeds. So we want to make sure to, in that respect, leave enough so that next year or the year after that, some of the seeds get into the soil, seed bank in the soil and we'll continue to have our beautiful wildflowers. Right, and thanks, Laura. Usually the rule for that that I was taught, I've been taught different rules of thumb. One is take no more than 10% of seeds from a plant, and um, one is take no more than 5% of seeds for a plant, but different people and different agencies have different rules, but you can come up with your own rule that seems to see, suit your purposes. Um, and then if you want to capture genetic diversity in plants, of course, all seeds capture a lot of genetic diversity. But if you can get seeds from more than one individual of the same species um, and take fewer seeds from a plant, then that is really nice because then you're going to capture that diversity. And then whatever the crazy climate and weather um, hand us, you'll have a good chance that some of your plants will do well no matter what. Um, so I think our first plant here that we're going to try to collect just do a little collecting from is um this beautiful um hoary aster it's um called um hoary aster or um dietaria canescence i think is the common scientific name we've got wasps here today and that just means be careful when you're picking because you can get stung sometimes and you can see that these all ripen at different times that's great because we can see exactly what we're collecting and so you can see the flower here and um, this is a composite flower or aster. And so we have a receptacle at the base. It holds the petals or and the center flower, center disc. So what we would call petals are called ray flowers. Um, what we would call the center are disc flowers. And so this flower probably consists of you know, maybe a hundred individual flowers here. And so when those flowers ripen, you can see here it's not ripe, but you can see here the individual little flowers and each one of those produces seeds. Um, and so that's, a, we'll see that a lot here with these fleabane, with this hoary aster. Um, that's about all we can see at the moment. And let's see, um, Laura has got some of the seeds here. And so for this one, when the flowers um, dry, when they ripen, this whole head becomes a seed head. And so we can take that whole thing, um, you see the little um, ons on the end and then the little seeds at the base. And you can see in the wind that these are designed to travel. And so depending on what you want to do, you can either collect an entire flower of that. And so just take it from the base and throw the whole thing in your bag and then clean out the, the, the bases later. Or you can just take off the seed and leave the little envelope that holds the seed at the bottom. Um, the other thing about this kind of aster, and you have to get to know your flowers a little, but a lot of the asters, you could collect a, seed, a flower like this right now, put it in your bag, and your seeds would ripen, sometimes even by the time you get home. And so sometimes you can do that. I've had people pick me bouquets, and I leave them along, and the seeds mature, and you get seed or something. So with some of these asters, with those very fine seeds, not ones like sunflowers, but ones like that, they'll mature for you as time goes on. Let's see. I think the next thing we're going to look here is talking about maturity. And so we're not going to harvest this seed right now. Um, and this is a plant that I'm going to be really careful touching because it's sacred datura, um, which has some really strong alkaloids in it. But you can see here, um, they also call this plant sometimes thorn apple. You can see this is a seed pod, and that will contain probably, oh, 50 or so larger seeds than we've been collecting, but it's not ripe yet. And so for something like this, if you wanted to grow it, you just note it has a seed pod, and then try to come back later when this pod will turn brown and begin to split open, and you'll see the seeds are ripe. Um, our next plant here is um, penstemon, and I believe this is Palmer's penstemon. So it has these blue-gray leaves. Um, 
And this is a good plant here because we can see a couple of things about panstemon seeds. And um, one is, are they ripe or not? So here you can see a stock where the seeds are ripening. Some of them are still kind of fleshy and soft to the touch. Some of them are brown and beginning to split open. And so for the best results on this, we want to get the ones that are brown and splitting open. So a lot of these, I think it's too early for. If they're green, it's definitely too early. But on the penstemons, one of the nice tricks you can do is when they're at this stage, I guess I'll take a seed off and show it, where the, you can get the seeds to come out so we know we have seeds. We can feel them. They're full bodied. They're kind of not quite rounded, but angular. So we know that they're full, that they're not just undeveloped. So those are beautiful seeds. Uh, actually, I could just throw it in here. And so for this, I'm going to use one of our bags because one of the great things you can do with penstemons is you can um, just clip the stem and then you want to just put it face down in your bag. And this one's too long. Sometimes I use bigger bags for this. But when you do that, what will happen is the seeds will just fall out of the, you can leave them in here. So you want the seeds facing down the stalks and then they'll begin to fall out in your bag and you won't have to go through a whole lot of work um, to get the seeds out. Um, it saves a lot of work if you do that and you just, um, sooner or later you can take the stalks out and all the mature seeds will drop out and you'll have probably thousands, hundreds or thousands of penstemon seeds say from just this one couple of stalks here on this plant. Um, I don't think you can see in there, but you can sure hear them rattling anyway. Okay, we're going to walk a little bit till we come to our next plant. Um, and let's see. Um, we're going to look here at some of the annual sunflowers. And so you can see once again, just like that um, hoary aster we looked at, the sunflowers in the aster family. And so it has um, an envelope of bracts that holds the flower. On the outside, it has the ray flowers, and you can pull those out and see. And in this case, they appear to be sterile. And then in the middle, you have the disc flowers, and each one of those is going to make a seed if we're lucky. Um, this year, it's been really a hard year for a lot of plants, and so some of these have frozen and not developed seeds. Some of them have dried out and not developed seeds, and some of them have developed seeds. So we're going to look to see if we can find one with seeds. Um, and let's see, if I cut this guy in half, you can see once again, here we have the same structures, the envelope below, the ray flowers are gone, and the middle of the disc flowers is where you get the seeds. And if I shake them out, you can see there's chaff present, which is all the fine stuff, all of the male and female parts of the flower and all the surrounding structures. But you can see here all of these beautiful black little sunflower seeds. And so these are your annual um, sunflower seed. Um, so you can leave some of them for the birds for sure. They really rely on these. But you can also collect these. And if you want to get our annual sunflower established in your yard, this one's a great one for just broadcast seeding wherever you want. It's not really a great plant for growing in containers. So you could just take them, store them, or even broadcast them now where you'd like them to be. Hmm. Do we have a, a, a grab bag? We'll just do that maybe. So one of the things we're doing is we're going to throw some of these seeds in kind of a grab bag and then we can just put it into place. So great, you can, it's great to do this if you're removing invasive plants. If you can put something back in to replace what you took out, it will help outcompete the invasives in the future. And so the best things for an area can frequently be the seeds you collect nearby just to fill in those spaces. Laura, you want to add anything? Uh, nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. There, yes. There is something. Everything I know about this I learned from Jam. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Golly gee. <laughs> or as Gomer Pyle would say, shazam, shazam. <laughs> I've been subjected to a lot of Gomer Pyle lately, but that's another story. Okay. All right. 
Um, let's see. I'm going to go around the back. And come back, John. Come back. Okay. Yeah, this is just one bag. Sure. A couple bags. Yeah, just one. So we're going to collect seeds here of Iris missouriensis. If I was um, younger and stronger, I would just leap up on this wall. Do you want me to go back? And then you you want to go back? Sure. Okay. So anyway, um, there's one plant in here in particular that would be a great plant to collect seeds of right now. And it is um, Missouri Iris or Western Blue Flag, Iris missouriensis. And you can see this is a plant with really conspicuous dried um, seed heads. These seeds tend to stay on the plant. That isn't the case. A lot of plants, like the penstemon, if you're not there when the seeds ripen, they'll just be gone pretty soon. But the iris, because of the structure and the shape, oh, we scared a bird out. Mm -hmm. um, the iris um, tends to hold the seeds in these ponds. And so when you're out um, and about, you'll see these beautiful strap-like leaves. And um, you see the iris pods there and Laura. Um, is going to collect some of these and show you the seeds and oh, oh she's going to hand me the seed. So let's see, here's the seed structure. And of course, this is another one really good for once you know you have seeds, putting it face down in the bag. Um, let's see what we've got. Oh, beautiful. Um, so we can shake those out, but you can do what we did with the penstemon too. And just once you know you've got seeds, you can put the seeds face down in the bag and they'll drop out on their own. But you can see these are a really nice size, pretty big seed. I would call this for natives a medium seed. Most of our natives don't have very big seeds at all. You can see they're full. And these we can take um, and plant. So we can use them either in a nursery situation or we can just sow them in the ground in a place that has the conditions similar to where they grow in nature. And in this case, um, scrape them into the ground. Um, usually for these, they like a cold treatment. So scraping them in at the end of autumn or beginning of winter or even going out and sowing them through the snow can be effective ways to begin to get these started if you want to direct seed in the landscape. So we have a couple questions. Um, one is don't irises grow from bulb? Uh, okay. Yeah, so irises, I had a question. So um, irises are rhizomatous. So um, today we're doing propagation by seed and seed collection, but you can also divide irises just like you can the garden ones. Um, and you can um, propagate them that way too. And if you have big clumps of them like this, um, like all irises, they'll usually benefit from um, being thinned out a little bit. So, and the seeds that you plant, the, when you plant from seed like this, how many years does it take for mm -hmm. them to flower? Um, I'm going to guess about three, depending on the garden conditions. You have any thoughts on that, Laura? Three sounds good. Um, I think when you kind of push them in the greenhouse, it might be two, but three is, is definitely... Right. Yeah, so Laura said, if, in case the sound is not good on that, which I don't know um, <laughs> if it is, um, since I've got the mic and she doesn't, um, that when she's grown them in the greenhouse, it may be two years from seed when you're really pushing the growth. Um, we've got some here in seed fields here that are between, um, well, they're mostly all two years old now from seed, and they haven't bloomed yet, but they're certainly, I think next year is going to be the year for them. And that's for the irises. What about other, are, do most, do some of these seeds flower in the first year? Or are they yeah, all year? so if there's a lot of variety, so plants can always be annual, in which case they are going to flower in the first year, and you're probably going to going to want to direct sow them rather than put them in a pot. Um, biennial, which means the first year you get a rosette and the second year you'll usually get flowers. And then perennial, which is usually the second. You can get on perennials, you know, any of these. You, well, biennials you can usually not get flowers the sec first year. It's usually routinely the second because then the plant dies. But perennials, you can get seeds anytime from the first year to um, many, many years after as they grow. Um, I found out on the living roof, which is just above us here, in terms of penstemons, which are thought of as sometimes short-lived perennials, that up there with heat and drought, we had a lot of plants um, setting seed and then dying and dropping their seed. And sometimes the seedlings within a couple of months with good rain would come up and bloom almost as if they were annuals. And so it's really amazing that some of, the, the, some of the natives are very adaptive. They just bloom a lot sooner than you think they will. What about which seeds need the 
cold um, treatment mm -hmm. or do all seeds yeah. only cold treatment? So, so there are a lot of resources about which seeds need cold treatment. Um, what we collected here so far today, um, the hoary aster doesn't need any treatment at all. If we collect the datura, it doesn't need treatment. Most of the penstemons do best with some kind of cold treatment, and so you can either give that to them by sowing them directly in autumn or through the snow, or by um, mixing them up with some kind of inert, sterile uh, medium in a little baggie or something, putting it in your refrigerator, or sowing them in seed flats and having them outside. And then they all have different times for um, how long you stratify them. Um, if we want to talk about stratification, the first thing about stratification is that it's usually cold, moist stratification. So it means you want the seeds to be take in water first, and the water is a catalyst for the biological processes that are going to allow the seed to germinate. So the, the water is an essential element. So just sticking seed in the refrigerator is not like the best way to stratify. So you want them to take in water first. So I'll usually soak them overnight in warm water, drain them out, mix them in with moist potting mix, and then put them in the refrigerator. In terms of how long to do it, there are all kinds of resources. Um, I've got a really good propagation database that was funded by the um, federal government through um, the Ecological Restoration Institute, um, and it's part of a book project that produced um, Guide to the Plants of the Ponderosa Pine Forest or whatever, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but I've got that, it's public domain, and if anyone really wants it, I'm really glad to share those propagation notes with you, and we could put up some other references, but you pretty much have to ask, and then it varies from location to location, from ecotype of the seed, a seed from a penstemon in Phoenix, the same species, if it grew up here, is probably gonna have totally different treatment requirements to germinate. Any more questions? Um, the, the other question was, somebody was asking if you could talk a little bit more about whether, how you do autumn, um, sowing seeds if in the autumn or during snow. Uh-huh. Well, the way that I like to sow seeds in autumn is um, to rough up the ground a little bit, scratch in the seeds, and, um, in the, and then um, scratch it back in and walk on it a little bit to hold it in place. If it's in an area like your garden or a place that you can control, putting a little mulch on it will be good. And I tend to like to use pine needles in a very fine, just kind of lattice work on the top, like maybe even as much as one or two pine needles, you know, depth and with openings in between it, because that will hold some moisture in when you do get moisture or if you water, it will help protect them and just keep them a little protected while they're growing. Um, winter seed sowing is just, you pretty much go out and there's the snow on the ground if you're lucky. And we did this in the seed fields this year. And you just sprinkle the seed on top. And since the seed is usually darker colored than the snow, it tends to actually bring heat to where the seed is on our sunny days and the seed will sink through the snow. And we've had really good luck on that kind of seeding in our seed fields here at the museum um, compared to fall sowing or spring sowing. Spring sowing out there has mostly not been very good at all. And that's we're saying without any additional water, just sowing in natural conditions. Um, fall sowing has been better than spring sowing. And if you're able to do um, the intermediate sowing um, when there's snow on the ground, which is usually here gone by spring, um, we've just had the best luck with that in terms of direct sowing. But, you know, whenever it's convenient for you to do it, sometimes there's a delay with seed when you direct sow it and it doesn't show up for a year or two. But usually there's, there are also these things about birds carrying the seed away and they can do that. But my experience is if you go back after a couple of years, you'll be surprised. We have seed that's been sowed in our seed fields and nothing happens. And it's like two or three years later and it's like, oh, it's finally come up. Look at that. So even when you think it doesn't work, if you have time, which in natural restoration you tend to have time then just that kind of you know you sooner or later the seed will usually come up if it's good seed um, let's see um, we've got some do those have seed Laura okay well if you want to try to so Laura is over there and she is collecting seeds of cut leaf coneflower which is a really um, big it's a perennial coneflower and 
Yeah, it does look like this is kind of late in the season. If you get here early, there should be all kinds of seeds in here. But you can see that within here there are some seeds, um, but doing this early would be better. But this one is a really great plant. It has about a three inch across large yellow cone flower on multiple stalks on it and it tends to come up really easily from seed without any treatment um, so this is one that probably would have been better to get earlier in the year but um, and the birds yeah birds love it and butterflies don't do anything with the seeds other than pollinate it but you can't have this plant with flowers without any butterflies on it So um, we're not going to collect these seeds because they're not ready today. But this is one where one of the things if you want to collect seeds is scouting. And scouting always means you go out, you find your plants. Because sometimes once they're in seed, they're not very obvious anymore. Um, but this one, you would find it. And this is a patchy plume. So it's a nice shrub in the rose family. And some members of the rose family have their seeds in hips. But some of our more beautiful ones around here, like prairie smoke, um, Arizona cliff rose, and this Apache plume, have these very um, plumed seeds. And so these aren't quite ripe yet. But um, you can see these will be ripe when they kind of turn to a, a beige or buff color. But you can see the seeds are forming now. Um, and if I take this off, um, you can see at the base, there are starting to be little green seeds, but you can tell these aren't ripe because they're skinny, they're green, and the tops are still very colorful. Um, I don't think we have examples here of ripe seeds. Um, but anyway, if you saw this, you would know well. You know, if it's on your daily walk, you could check it out, come back in a few weeks, um, but you want to wait till the right time. And the right time for these seeds, the awns will actually be longer. The seeds will be brown and filled and have kind of an oval shape. And then, you know, you can just once again, if they pull out easily, which these don't, and you come out and you have brown seeds on them, then you know this one's ready to collect. Um, what else do we have here? I think we'll do this one just because it's um, something everybody asks about every year. And um, I think they changed the name of this one, but um, I know it as, um, what do they call it? Kinopodium graviolans. And it, it has um, some name about being stinky. But anyway, it's just a beautiful annual. You're going to see it in the forest right now. And it's going to turn this beautiful pink purple color. Um, and just you'll just see it um, kind of as a, a ground cover lighting up the forest with color. So we get a lot of questions this time of year about this plant and what it is. Um, it has, this one is actually, I can feel the seeds in it already. And so even though it's not quite dried out, it does have some seeds on it. And if I rub with my hands, they come out. And there's the beginning of seeds. I'm probably a little bit later when it's dried down would be a better time to collect but this is another one if you like the color and the beauty of it you could just collect these and then take them out into your location and scratch them into the soil and hope for that next year you'll have this plant coming up it's an annual so it's going to have seeds the first year and then it's going to die but once you get a lot of those started they'll keep self-sowing in your garden you got all the goods Okay, we're going to take a little walk now so you guys can rest your minds and ask questions. <sighs> so, as I point out, we talked about, here's the hoary aster again. You can see the flowers. You can see the, the fluffy little seed heads. Right next to it is this small white aster. And this one is going to be real similar in terms of how its seeds develop. So this is earlier on in the cycle. But once again, it's going to have little plumose seed heads coming off. And it's going to, they're going to come off really easily. And probably if I collected these today and put them in a bag, they would probably um, turn into seeds anyway. And same thing here for this little native flea bane. Um, once again, if I pick these today, it'll dry up and the seeds will probably be ripe, or you can wait till you see the fluffy seed heads on it.
Yeah. Yeah. So um, that the way that you can pick um, asters, things in that family, or what we would kind of call daisies, maybe, um, as long as they're in the part of the tribe that has the fluffy seed heads, that works. If they're the sunflower part, or the other, if there's another tribe too, I think that it has different seeds. <laughs> But I'm not thinking of it today, but for those, um, you have to wait till the seeds are ripe. Sunflowers, if you pick them green or immature, aren't going to ripen for you. Thank you. You realize you should go back and do a refresher on the plant tax. Um, here's one flower that a lot of people will see lately in the, around in Flagstaff that's a wildflower. Um, these are really sad looking right now, but this is a, a Mexican hat or yellow cone flower. So they're the ones that have the red cone flowers on them, yellow or sometimes mahogany color. And these have a really interesting seed structure because the whole cone holds your seeds. They tend to hold their seed for a while and these are great. Because look at that, you just crumble it up. So you want to get it when it's dry enough to crumble. And obviously they stay on the plant for a while. And you can see, oh boy, that's probably two, two, three hundred seeds there. And this is another one that you can spread. Um, it's a really easy to grow wildflower. You could grow it in a nursery with no treatment, or you could just spread it outside. So that's a great one that you can see. You can have maybe you have half of those seeds um, germinated if you spread it out. You'd have 150 of these plants in your yard, which would be spectacular. Um, and then the other thing I guess I want to talk about that too, if we're talking about direct seeding, is that don't go overboard on your seed density. If you think that maybe even 1% of your seed is going to germinate, and you think that maybe a plant would take up about a square foot of room, you really want to have about 15 seeds, 20 seeds, 25 if you're feeling really nervous, fewer if you're feeling confident per square foot in your garden. So you don't want pounds and pounds of seed. Because if you get too many, and it's a good year and they germinate, they'll all out-compete one another, and you'll be very sad because they'll germinate, but they'll all out-compete each other and you won't end up with plants. So sparing, especially with native seed that's locally adapted, sparing seeding is good. So we're because she seeds and we don't have too many of them around here. Um, but this is a Arizona wild grape. And seriously, this is the first time I've seen an Arizona wild grape uh, have fruit in Flagstaff. Um, the reason is because grapes produce their fruit on second year wood. And when it's cold here, every year, if your first year wood freezes, you never get second year wood. So I know a lot of people who have planted grapes and ripped them out of the ground in anger because they never get grapes. But mostly it's just because you do need that second year wood. Um, so if you can plant them in protected locations um, where this, it won't freeze the tips, then you're more apt to get seeds. Um, so the grapes on these had pretty much been picked over by birds and animals, and they seem to really enjoy it. But you can see, um, here's some small grapes. And pretty much once your fruit is maturing, your seeds on these are going to be ripe. I squish it out here. And you can see that's a nice big grape seed. Um, so that's when the plastic bags come in hand. And you can put the seeds in your bag so you don't smush everything up. And it looks like these fruits have, um, they've got one seed or two seeds per fruit. So if you need a quantity of seeds, you can see that has two. So they're not huge seed producers, but they do have some nice big seeds. And then the other way of collecting is that, um, as one of my volunteers so indelicately pointed out to me the other day, the birds are coming here and pooping out the seeds. And so you can see here, the birds have pre-cleaned the seeds. I'm not really going to get into this with my hands today. Certainly want to have gloves, but once again, you could collect your seeds right here. The birds have left them behind. Um, sometimes they pass through their digestive system and that will help the seeds. Sometimes in this case, it just looks like these birds ate the flesh and left the skin and the seeds behind. The thing about fleshy seeds is that once they come out of the fruit and are clean and dry, they tend to go into dormancy. Frequently, if you collect them in the fruit, mash up the fruit and plant them with the fruit, you won't have any dormancy. And so um, 
So a lot of seeds that are hard, you know, like a lot of seeds will say, oh, it takes four months cold treatment um, for fleshy fruits. A lot of times, if you just take them out fresh from the fruit and plant them squished up with the fruit, you don't have to go through this whole dormancy breaking thing of cold treatment and sometimes other secondary dormancies that develop. And so like elderberries, if you get elderberries and just squish them up, make them into a mash and seed them out, they will germinate without treatment frequently. Um, so, and then sometimes, which is not this case, the fruit will actually have um, growth inhibitors and keep the seeds from germinating. And so sometimes it helps just to wash away the fruit. But if you don't let them go dry, you usually have minimal dormancy. Now, grapes are like irises. Why would I grow this from seed when I can take a cutting and easily grow it? And so you can do um, cuttings of grapes too. I'm not going to go into details now, but most grapes propagate really easily from cuttings. But Seeds will bring in that more element of more genetic diversity, and sometimes you just go with what you have. Sometimes you got seeds, sometimes you got cuttings, sometimes you're set up and you do better with one or the other. After it freezes, um, if, it, if the seeds are still in the it's frozen, will they still germinate? that way or yeah okay cool yeah yeah i mean I'm free all of these plants are really cold hardy i don't think most of them are going to suffer from the seed freezing as long as it's developed don't fall over okay well we're going to take a little stroll over now towards the michael moore medicinal garden um gardens are really great places to collect seed because and you know where it is and usually you're tending it so you can keep a close eye on it. Um, in theory. In theory. So um, as we walk along, this is, a, this is a, um, an Arizona rose. And one of the funny things with Arizona rose is it seems like some years you have good, um, good years for rose hips and some years you have good years for insect galls. And this plant seems like this year, um, so you first want to know what seed am I collecting, because I've seen people will collect galls. So here's a little wild rose hip. It's on the small side, and so the question will be, how are the seeds in it? Usually once the rose hips are red, though, you can collect the seed. Um, this one probably stay on a little bit longer, but you can see many small seeds in there. And this one um, usually takes a little cold treatment. I haven't grown it if the seeds haven't been sitting around to know if it's actually true that planting them right now, they would not have dormancy. But usually this one's one that takes a couple of months cold treatment. Um, and for that, I would just soak them in water, mix up a little stuff in a bag and put them in the baggie. Um, galls, you know, they don't look right now too much like seed pods, but if you didn't have the rose hips, you might think, Oh, uh, that has some really weird seed pods. But this is um, some kind of insect gall, and gosh knows what'll happen if we cut it open. You can see it looks like it had some eggs laying in there, but nobody has really hatched out in here. Sometimes you'll cut them open and see the insects, but this looks like the little insects either burrowed their ways out or never actually developed in the galls. But these are little insect nests that they build. They inject the plants with some kind of insect substance and it makes the galls grow and they put their eggs in them and that's how insects can propagate themselves. Insect seeds. Any more questions while we're traveling, Kristen? Okay, well, we're entering the Michael Moore Medicinal Garden, and you guys probably have heard about it if you've been following the videos. But um, anyway, everything in this plant is native to um, the Colorado Plateau, and everything has a medicinal use. Um, mostly. mostly, says Laura. So Laura, this is Laura's garden, and so she's going to guide me to the plant and maybe say its name, and then we'll talk about how to get the seeds. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll just have our joint collection bag unless there's something. Okay, so we'll start with, this is one of my favorite grasses. There are, well, okay, there are a lot of native grasses that I like, but this is Indian rice grass. I'll let 
um, Jesse, the botanical name of it. Acnatherum hymenoides. And doesn't it usually drop its seed? Yeah, so this is, a, a, it's actually sometimes even thought of as a drop seed. Um, but anyway, this plant will drop its seeds. It looks like it's late in the season. This is a real early bloomer. And we talked about the time to collect seeds for some plants can be early summer. And so this is in there. We did find a few seeds in these glooms the other day. And today I'd love to find a seed and pop it out, but we may not see them at all. They're little black seeds, and I'm not finding them. But anyway, this is one that, yes, we probably pop. Oh, here's one. Okay. <laughs> so as you feel them on this, these glooms, some of them feel empty. They're just like a little paper envelope. But this one felt a little something, and lo and behold, there is a seed. So even this time of year, you can find some seeds on this plant. But if you were to come early in the season, your seeds are probably fuller, riper, have a better chance of viability. And, um, but they would look something like that. And those pretty much you end up taking out one at a time or popping them out or cutting your stems off and putting them face down in a bag. And do you have any tricks on getting those to germinate? Oh gosh, my tricks on getting those to germinate, I should ask you for your tricks. So this plant, it's hard to germinate. Sometimes it can take a long time. It seems to um, naturalize. So once you have plants and they drop, they seem to come up on their own. The wisdom is with the, to have older seeds so that fresh seed um, is not as viable as older seed. But there's some kind of after ripening going on. And the other thing that I've done with these, trying to grow them in a nursery that has been successful, has been soaking the seeds for multiple days in water and they swell up. They have some kind of natural polymer or something around them. Just looks just like a soil polymer. It swells up around the seed and then I think it kind of imbibes into the seed coat and when you plant them that will help them actually bring in water which is probably why these guys are so darn drought tolerant. It's one of the most drought tolerant natives around this area. Any other ideas that you've had Laura? Well I had heard that it was age. I had heard that um, Phil Patterson who used to be the manager at the NAU greenhouse said the ones that germinated the best had sat on someone's desk for 11 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hope you have time and be really thankful that you do not have to collect these seeds for your meals. Can you imagine going through with a basket kind of scooper collecting these? <laughs> I'd be very hungry. I'd be thinner. But anyway, so there we go. And then next, uh, they're just, these are the um, sunset crater penstemon, but you can see that they're not ripe yet. So they're, if you were touching them, they're soft still, they're green, they're getting a little red upon the seam where they'll open up. They still have um, like their um, stigma sticking out at the end where they were pollinated. And so this is not ripe. So this is come back later, folks. Do you want to do a little bit Sure, sure, sure. So one of the things that's really fun to grow from seed, and if you like to collect a lot of seed for um, restoration or whatever purpose, native grasses are great. Um, and you, you know, if you have weeds and you pull them out, you want to get native grasses in there a lot. I know we all want wildflowers, but the grasses and the wildflowers go together and the grasses start making good soil with their root system. And they start making a little place where some of the native flowers can nestle and get a little protection and grow. So if you've got a really um, difficult dry area and you had a lot of weeds you pulled out, native grasses can be great. Um, so this is um, Blue Grandma Budalua gracilis, and a lot of people know it as eyelash grass or they know it as monocle grass because later on it gets a little curve on the stem. So it looks like you're holding up your monocle. Um, all the seeds are this are on one side of the stem and these are the seed heads. And I think these probably are pretty ripe. And so one of the things I can do is if I rub this um, and things pop out, you know, I, I am not a person who picks out my grass seed. I just collect them and sow it chaff and all, unless you have to count it for an experiment or something. But you can see each one of those is a little seed. So once again, we've got a whole lot of seeds in here before they blow away. <laughs> and so these are ripe. You can collect them when they're ripe. We'll look at some other grasses. If you get out to a grass and it's very green, it's still in flower or something, you can't really collect it then. But once seeds are in what they call the hard dough stage where you can open up the seed and it's not just green, it's not just milky liquid, but it's kind of almost like eh, some 
kind of watery bread dough or even hard bread dough, you can actually collect seeds at that stage. So for these, these are ripe now, but if they weren't ripe, or if we just want to, we can collect them on the stem. Oops, good job. <laughs> the stem and throw it into the bag. Um, for, for seeds that are in the soft dose, the hard dose stage, so they're white and milky, but not hard, but you know, but not soft and gooey. If you collect them on the stems and leave them in a bag, they will mature as long as you didn't get them too soon. So that can be a help if you're collecting grass seed and you've gone a long way to get it and you don't want to go back again. Uh, what are we going to do next? Maybe we'll do this grass because we're here, even though the other grasses are pretty. Since we're doing grasses, um, this is another grass that's ripe right now. So grasses can be cool season grass, like the Indian rice grass was. They can be warm season grasses, like the blue grandma and this Arizona fescue. And so Arizona fescue, you'll probably recognize it. It's very, very fine textured leaves. They almost look rolled. If you bother to take a leaf and look at it, you can roll it in your fingers. And earlier in the season, they say that these um, flowering stalks have kind of a pyramid shape to them, like the Great Pyramids. Um, but right now, as they're ripe, they narrow again. So these are definitely ripe. They've got the straw color, um, and they come off nicely. So once again, they're very easy to take off. And then there are many, many, many seeds there. So you don't have to worry about getting the seeds out. Just know that most of this is seeds. Um, now, our next one. Or the, uh, Can I do this one? So there's some really cool things here. Laura says this is the wasp plant. And one thing about seed collecting is I think we talked about it, but you frequently would like to collect. If you've got wasps and biting insects present, you want to collect early in the day or late in the day when they're asleep and they're not going to get mad at you. Um, but this could be the action shot. But um, if things are wet, then it's really hard to collect them when you bring them back. You have to put them in, spread them out and dry them or else they'll rot. Um, but that's a good example here. Now this is called winged buckwheat and this is an interesting one. It's a biennial. Um, so it had a rosette at the base the first year, second year it's blooming. And then this year it's interesting because its seeds are forming, hanging down below the other flowering parts, which is kind of unusual to see these three winged um, dangly seeds. Um, you can see these are still kind of green. Um, if we look around, we find ones that are getting to be browner and more translucent. But for these, we're gonna wait. By the time we go to actually collect these, the wasps are gonna have moved on because all of the flowers are gonna have um, already given all their nectar and pollen. And then we can just take these seeds off. But when they're done, they're gonna be papery. And we'll see another buckwheat later on that's a perennial. And we can see the difference and see what those seed heads look like when they're, when the flowers, the flowers stay on and the seeds are with them. But when they're ripe, the whole thing will turn brown. Okay, let's see. Maybe we'll do another grass while we're at it. Do you wanna put it in a bag or you just wanna? Okay, I'll just throw, throw it in here. So this is another, we saw um, Blue Grandma. And remember that the um, seed heads were all on one side of the stem. Well, that's kind of a characteristic among the Bootaluas or the Blue Grandmas, the Grandma grasses. And you can see here that these kind of hang down on one side. So this is Side Oats Grandma. And I guess they say that because they're all on the side. It's got big coarse seeds and we'll see. Did the, are these ripe? Voila, they came off nicely and easily and they're a nice tan color. Um, I'm gonna put them in my little bag. And then if Chris wants another close up, since I did it too quickly, you can see. So these are bigger seeds. I think there's only about 200,000 of these to a pound. So <laughs> even an ounce would have quite a few seeds if you collected an ounce. This bag might be a couple ounces if we filled it. Um, most of the grasses, um, other than the Indian rice grass, are pretty easy to germinate. Um, so most of these you can germinate. You can direct sow them or plant them in pots. Usually you do a few in each pot because if not, you won't get any. If you plant a lot in each pot, you'll get all of them will germinate. It's the law of unintended seed germination is that if you're cautious, you don't, you know, they won't germinate. And if you're profligate, they'll all germinate. But anyway, um, most of those germinate really well without any kind of treatment. 
So you could just sow them in a place, water it, and probably it's gonna to have to be the right time of year for them to come up. Um, the cool season grasses, like the Indian rice grass, they're called cool season because they come up at the end of the hopeful um, spring melt. So, and in the um, early stages when um, temperatures are more like about 40 degrees and um, the warm season grasses come up usually with the monsoons, which we hope we have, and they come up frequently when the temperatures of the soil are about 70 degrees. And so you can use those as germination um, temperatures too. So our next little plant, Laura has been so kind as to get one of the special little envelopes here that holds the super fine seed because we're going to get seeds of this coral bell. And you can see the coral bell, it's kind of indeterminate. It bloomed some, they fried or died or matured, and now it got some rain, they're coming up again. And a lot of the plants will do that and it's more usually rain-based than it is um, temperature-based. Um, or even irrigation based. Sometimes they won't even come up. But this is going to be really hard to see. Um, the seeds, this is the, almost all chaff in here, but the seeds are like little grains of dust. And so we checked this out the other day to see if there were seeds. You can try to do it. Okay. Can you hold this a sec? Or? Okay. Let's see if I can see if with this wind it might be hard. Okay, there are probably about 100 seeds there. The tiny brown specks are the seeds and the bigger specks are the flower pieces. So you can see we want to put these in something very, very tight and able to hold them and bring them back inside so we don't lose them. And then we can clean them. Oh, oh. Is it important to clean the seeds? Um, it's not. <laughs> I'm going, yes, you see. Why do you think it's important? I, well, it's really meditative. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so you sit there, well, especially the little guys, there's just something really peaceful about going through um, and getting rid of the chaff and then finding the seeds. Now, that is when you're not cleaning 950 billion of them, when you're just doing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of get to know what the seed looks like because there have been times um, with, with one of the plants that I planted the chaff one year because I didn't know what the seed looked like. And so it, it does help. I mean, then you know you do have seeds. Yeah. And so yeah, that's yeah. Nice and for a hand lens too, if you have a hand lens or you can visit somebody with a dissecting scope, you can really get to go through this stuff and see what the seeds are, make sure you have them, make sure they're filled. I just say no, because if you're going to sow it in some situations, the chaff's not going to hurt and yeah. might even help. But if you want, you know, if you do an experiment or you want to know you have a hundred seeds, there's only one way to do it. We have a lot of tricks of the trade. We didn't get them out for today, but we've got um, different, they're actually soil sieves that are great because with any seed type, you'll find out what size of sieve will hold, will like let the seeds go through, keep the chaff above, and maybe even let the fine dirt fall below. And so you can do some really good um, seed cleaning with those sieves. You can use a lot of the traditional <laughs> shaking the basket thing on a windy day like today you can even let the wind do some of your work but you have because it'll blow away the chaff so we should do a whole one on seed cleaning someday okay. <laughs> oh next week stay tuned next week we'll show you all the fun stuff and we'll be indoors for that pretty much i think question came up about whether any of these plants are poisonous or um or dangerous to plant to pets um, well, some people would think the grass that we haven't shown yet, which is squirrel tail, can um, embed itself in dogs' ears and mouths and stuff. Um, so some people might not want to plant that one, particularly in their yard with animals. It's all over the wild. Um, and then the Datura has really heavy-duty alkaloids, and I wouldn't handle it ever without wearing gloves. You definitely don't want to be licking your fingers. I've never known a dog or cat to eat it, which doesn't mean it can't happen, but I think for the most part, most animals unless their puppies have a pretty good sense of not eating them but you might not want those around if you have um babies baby babies and and willful dogs and cats i don't know i've never heard of them eating it but it could happen um yeah how many do we have time for how's our time um on it an hour <laughs> well okay well do we want to cut it here do we Okay, let's do the milk. 
Okay, let's do the milkweed and, oh, and I can't resist because this is a desert columbine and most of the columbines um, bloom early, but these are having some late bloom. And so some of the pods may have seeds and some may not. So we can see here that these straw ones have already split and dispersed their seeds, but the green ones are just getting ready to open now. And once they do, um, a little bit longer when they'll turn straw, but they haven't dropped their seeds. Laura's got a good one. Maybe. You can see there's a bunch of really wonderful desert columbine seeds. So that's a little local limestone endemic. If you live down in Kachina and mountain air, you might have these growing out of rocks um, or any place where there's limestone overhang over by continental, etc. So this is a great one. And the columbines, if you want to germinate them in a home nursery situation, you can give them no treatment or a month cold. If you want to throw them down and let them self-seed in your garden, you can just do that. Do you want these to self-seed here, Laura? Okay, we're going to put them in with the other good plants. Hmm, there we go. All right, one more plant. And then we, we knew we could talk forever, so... If you're still with us, we're really enjoying this and hope you are too. I'm learning a lot. So um, I guess our last plant of the day is going to be this wonderful um, world milkweed, um, Asclepias verticillata. And so um, some people don't like this. Um, I think cattle aren't supposed to eat it. Hopefully we don't have a cattle. Nope. But it's a wonderful plant. And in case you haven't heard the news, um, the world milkweed, all of the milkweeds, and in particular this world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, which is because the leaves whirl around the stems. Um, it's a food plant for the monarch butterfly. And so monarchs totally require milkweeds to lay their eggs and have their caterpillars hatch out. And this is the food plant for the caterpillars, which look a little like tomato worms. So if you ever get them, don't kill them. Um, but you can see here the milkweed pods are green and full. And then at the point of ripeness, um, you can see the seeds come out and they disperse on their own. Um, and these, in terms of collecting, you really want to have your bag ready. Um, and because they're going to blow away. Um, so ways to collect them, you can, if they're already blown away, you can take them out. And you can see the fluff really makes these want to travel. Um, these are pretty skinny seeds, so we don't know if they're viable. Um, they should be a little fuller, but we're going to collect them anyway, because maybe they'll work. But you can see this one you don't want to do in the wind, and you can see the fluff will travel. I just started collecting some the other day to see if it would work. And uh, milky sap usually needs clippers because you don't want to get it on your hand. Um, but for these, if we cut them at the base and throw them in our bag, they will um, pretty much disperse inside the bag. They're kind of like peas in a pod, but they'll blow away. And we can take those indoors and clean them because planting these, trying to do anything with them with the tails on, they're just going to fly away. Um, but yeah, so that's world milkweed. Um, the caper for cleaning is important. Yes, for cleaning, you mostly want to be indoors. And these are tough. And these are toxic, so um, don't rub the milky sap on your hands um, and don't lick your hands. And I've never known an animal to eat them, but you might want to watch it. And the interesting thing I would just say about this one here is we're having problems with this bed. And a lot of our plants have died in it. So you can't oh, here. <laughs> Come, I'll hand it to you. And it's an hour, so <laughs> Here. Oops. Okay, will it work without it or? Yeah. I just wanted to say we are having problems with this bed and the things that we've planted in it, all, but for the artemisia and a couple things have died, but the um, world milkweed and some of the other natives have just volunteered here. So if you have a place where it's hard to get things to grow, something like this might work for you and for the butterflies. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that's a wrap. If you have any questions, we'll um, try to answer them online. And I guess stay tuned for next week when we're going to do some seed processing and cleaning and um, talk about more about seed treatments. And we'll put some kind of list up today with what we did. It's not up yet, but check back, and we will have some kind of um, handout that you can get off of the Facebook page that will teach you what we um, review and give you some of the names of the things we worked with today. 
up. If you didn't hear that, um, we're going to have a handout online and we'll answer your questions. Thanks for being with us.